Welcome to the Upper Room. I'm Amy Steele, Dean of the Upper Room Chapel. We gather today from holy spaces all over the world for a midweek moment to worship and pray. As important as it is to welcome each of you, we also acknowledge those who walked the grounds before we did. As we learn, we invite you to learn about the indigenous nations in your location those who inhabited the land before they were usurped by warring powers. As we gather here in Nashville, Tennessee, we acknowledge the Cherokee, the Shawnee, the Yuchi people, the traditional custodians of the land on which this chapel stands. We recognize that they have occupied and cared for this land over countless generations, and we celebrate their continuing contributions to the life of the world. May is Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month in which we celebrate and recognize the cultural and historical contributions of Asian Pacific Americans to the United States. Along with 15 Asian Pacific American ethnic groups in the United Methodist Church, Cambodian, Chinese, Filipino, Formoso, for, for more, for, sorry, Formosan, Hmong, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Laotian, Middle Easterners, Pakistani, South Asians, Vietnamese, Tongans, Samoans, and Fijians, we honor the heritage and legacy of Asian Pacific Americans. As we celebrate Asian Pacific Heritage Month, may we know better about Asian American and Pacific Islander heritage and build the nation under God who calls us to unite in diversity. And now, beloved companions, I am honored to introduce to you the Reverend Thomas Kim, the Director of Korean and Asian News at United Methodist Communications. So as we begin our time of prayer and reflection, let us open our hearts and our minds to the presence of the Holy One, the Great Divine. As you inhale and exhale, breathe in the love of God and exhale your attention or worry. <laughs> Let us pray. 
Lord, in these times when we fear we are losing hope or feel that our efforts are futile, let us see in our hearts and minds the image of your resurrection and let that be our source of courage and strength. With that and in your company, help us face challenges and struggles against all that is born of injustice. Amen. Our scripture for today is from Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 1. Send out your bread upon the waters, for after many days you will get it back. This is the word of life. Thanks be to God. Just before I preach, I would like to remember and pray for the 10 victims of the Buffalo shooting, one of the deadliest massacres, massacres in American history. Let us pray. Lord, heal us, teach us that love overcomes hate and lead us to love our neighbors. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, the healer and the Prince of Peace. Amen. There is a story told of a young man in the Great Depression who saw a help-wanted ad in the newspaper for a telegraph operator. He had studied Morse code at home while he was unemployed, but he had no experience. His heart sank as he joined a room full of other men seeking the same job. He found a chair and sank into it, already feeling dejected. After only a few minutes, though, his face suddenly brightened up. He jumped up out of his chair and ran into the manager's office. Within a few minutes, the manager appeared at the door to announce that the job had been filled. One of the other men who had been waiting asked with great astonishment, what did he say that landed him the job? After all, he was the last one here. The manager answered. 
It was nothing, he said. All morning long, I have been tapping out the message on my office window. In Morse code. It was loud enough for all of you to hear. The message was this. If you can understand this message, come on in. You are hired. <laughs> all of you heard the noise. He was the only one who listened. By the noise of the world, we become deaf. And by prejudice and thoughts of the world, we become blind. They obscure us from listening to God as well. When David Kim asked me if I can preach in English at the, at the Upper Room Chapel to celebrate Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, my initial response was no. In English, preaching in English with my strong, thick, rich, and blessed Korean accent. <laughs> However, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, Apostle Paul says like this, Proclaim the message. Be persistent. Whether the time is favorable or unfavorable. So here I am. <laughs> By the way, can you follow me? Okay, if not, I can preach in Korean. <laughs> I can do it, I can do it so confidently. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Then I will continue to do it in English. The Bible says, cast your bread upon the waters, and after many days you will find it again. I can't speak for everyone, but bread that comes out of the water is usually pretty wet and soggy and quite unappealing. <laughs> Have you ever tried eating wet and soggy bread? Yuck. <laughs> so far, this proverb isn't making too much sense. How should we how should this um, proverb apply to our lives today? Bread could be a metaphor for the stuff of value. Let me ask you one thing. What kind of bread do you have to cast upon the waters? For me, the most precious bread I have is Jesus Christ, my Lord. In John 6.51, Jesus says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Let me share my personal story. Some of you may know. On December 6, 2011, there was a bombing in Kabul, which killed 59 people and injured more than 200. At the time, I did not know that such an incident had occurred or that the capital of Afghanistan was Kabul. Even if I had known, I would have thought of it as just an incident that occurred in a faraway country on the other side of the globe, where war and terror have always been constant. Till I found that one of my family members was one of those victims. After a short-term mission trip to Afghanistan, my sister-in-law sold her medical clinic in Detroit. Her husband resigned from his job, and they took their two daughters to Afghanistan to begin missionary work 
providing medical services, and teaching English and computer skills. I was worried about her going with the young children to share the gospel in that difficult place. Ultimately, I didn't give a word of encouragement and only objected. Just 40 days after arriving in the country, my brother-in-law was killed in the bomb attack before even starting his ministry. I could not stand home in Chicago after hearing the tragic news. So I went to Kabul to attend his funeral. During my stay, I discovered something very surprising as I chatted with missionaries there. Most of them are Korean. About 3,000 Korean Christians used to visit Afghanistan each year. As a short-term mission teams, they built schools and houses, dug springs, made prosthetic legs for those who lo lost the limbs to mines, and treated the sick and sometimes they fed the hungry, all while asking for nothing in return. They kept doing it until it was banned to travel to the country by the Korean government after a Korean mission team was kidnapped, and some of them were killed by Taliban. Missionaries I met there were not always somehow satisfied with their mission. All the missionaries I met in Kabul were lay members, and they began sharing their difficulties, frustrations, and pains they experienced daily. And they seemed to want to be comforted by me the only clergy there. The most discouraging and exhausting problems for them were the feeling that people are not honest, not good at keeping their promises, lazy and shameless. When they had that kind of experience repeatedly, they wondered, why they were there, questioned their calling and asked themselves whether it was time to pack up and go back home. After hearing such a story, my heart was heavy on my return to Chicago, leaving my sister-in-law who just lost husband, and two nieces who lost the father. As, was, as I was thinking about this on the airplane, I remembered the reports of an American missionary to Korea that I had read during my seminary. It was roughly something like this. Koreans are lazy, good at lying, addicted to drinking and gambling. The learned and the rich have concubines. Koreans are docile and polite, but they have all possible evil customs, singularly except not using opium. That was what Korea looked like about 150 years ago. And then the Korean Peninsula was divided into North and South. As soon as it was liberated from Japanese rule in 1945, 
and then suffered again the Korean War, which destroyed everything that was left for three years from 1950 to 1953. So all human and intellectual resources were dried up. It is known to Koreans that British newspaper columnist Norman Taylor wrote about the situation in Korea during that period. Expecting democracy to flower in Korea is like expecting, to ro to ro expecting a rose to bloom in a garbage can. However, on July 2nd, 2021, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development raised Korea's status from a developing economy to a developed one. That kind of move was the first by the agency since it began in 1964. Korea, which had been devastated in its entirety, was one of the poorest countries in the world, ranked 85th out of 100 countries in terms of exports in 1950. But in 2020, it exports $527 billion, ranking sixth, not 60, just the six without zero in the world. This development is unprecedented in history. If you have an interest in Korea, you may know that the miraculous progress is seen not only in the economy, but also in politics and social issues, including human rights, culture, and religion. You know BTS. You know Squid Game or Ojinger Game. Many movies and dramas. K-pop, K-drama, K-movie. Listen carefully. There are many reasons for Korea's remarkable growth and progress. And I strongly believe at the least some credit for it belongs to the missionaries who spread the gospel of Jesus, planted the Christian spirit into the Korean minds, and who cast bread upon the waters. The Korean Peninsula, even though they were disappointed at times for 150 years, Ecclesiastes chapter 11 verse 1 says, Cast your bread upon the waters, and after many days you will find it again. In the new revised standard version, might be read for us this morning, says, Send out your bread upon the waters, for after many days, you will get it back. Casting upon the waters is hopeless act with no use and not economically minded. However, our God, Jehovah, tells us to cast and send out your bread on the waters. Perhaps Afghanistan today is a country with no expectations and hope. And wishing for change may be like expecting a rose to bloom in a garbage can. Apostle Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, Therefore, my sisters and brothers, stand firm. 
Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. The Bible tells us a marvelous promise. Cast your bread upon the waters, and after many days you will find it again, and your labor in the Lord is not in vain. What a beautiful promise of God. Who can say that Afghanistan will not be prospering and growing like Korea 150 years later? I pray and hope that someday the Afghans may witness that they have lived by the bread you send upon the waters. Let me tell you one more time. Cast your bread upon the waters, and after many days, you will find it again. Let the people of God say, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Kim, thank you for that message this morning, musicians. The music has been beautiful. Would you pray with me?
for wisdom to teach us and guide us. For the leaders of the nations and all in positions of authority. For justice, peace, equity, human rights, and freedom among all peoples of the earth. For a just and merciful end to the pandemics of COVID-19, systemic racism, colonialism, war, and violent abuses around the world. For the equitable distribution of the COVID-19 vaccine and for healthcare workers around the world. For those suffering physically, emotionally, economically, and spiritually. For those feeling afraid and lost and alone. For women fearful of losing guaranteed reproductive health care and the right to their bodies. For our black siblings traumatized by the domestic terrorism of white supremacy in Buffalo, New York, and in all the places where racialized crimes occur. For our Asian siblings, especially those in Laguna Woods, California, and in all the places where racialized crimes occur. For all who are mourning the death of loved ones, the death of dreams, the death of hope. For the fragility of our local and global communities. As we join our voices with all the saints and angels of God, let us offer ourselves and one another to the living God through Christ. Let us commit to co-creating a world full of peace, human dignity, and loving hospitality. Help us, O oh God, to recommit to joy. Amen. Friends, thank you for joining us. We have heard the good news. And now let us be the good news in the world. Take care of yourselves and each other. And remember, God loves you. Till we meet again, go in peace. Amen.